So hello and welcome to this video. My name is Dr. Lask. I'm a consultant radiologist and we are going to be joined today by Umer Janjua or Dr. Janjua who is a consultant radiologist who spends a lot of his time in Dubai and that's right I'm in Dubai as well. I am in the Fairmont Hotel in the Palm and it's really nice out here but I wanted to find out a little bit more about what your story is, what's going on, how this whole teleradiology thing can work. And we come from slightly different areas of looking into this, basically. I guess I've got a different lens when it comes to this. Now, I do a bit of NHS and I also do some teleradiology, whereas yourself, you, you mainly do teleradiology with a few more things which we'll come through to. And also, I've got a lot of questions that come up from all of you guys about all of this stuff. So I'm going to try and go through that and answer as many questions as I can. Thanks, Imran. My name is Amer. I've been living here for about two years and I'm a radiologist, consultant radiologist. I qualified in 2016. Just after I qualified, I did another degree in management at UCL and I had a couple of startups as I was a registrar and early consultant. None of them really took off. And then I found myself coming out to the UAE for a job in a private hospital. And then I lasted 15 months. Uh, and it was a great experience, to be honest, great friends, but it wasn't for me. And in the middle of all of this, I started doing teleradiology for the UK, as many people do, but I made it my main, my main way, so it wasn't actually a planned move. Mm -hmm. But of course, then along all of this journey, I had a meeting, a fortuitous meeting with Daniel Surreal, mm -hmm. he's the CEO of my company, yeah, yeah. my teleradiology company, and essentially he offered me a position where I would not only report, I can earn my way as a radiologist when I'm used to, mm -hmm. but the other half of my job is essentially building business for the company in the region, so it was exactly at my street. And that's, that's what I've been doing two years. And that's the thing, you've got like the beaten path, right, where you become a consultant, you work away in the hospital that you're working at, get well known, and then you start getting some private work. But then you start to see different careers pop up, which is your career. And there's a few people out there that do very different things, yeah. where they kind of change things up a bit. And maybe on some level, I might be doing something slightly mm. similar. I've got you here, man. I want to talk about Dubai. Yeah. Like, yeah. What is it like here, man? This place is crazy fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think it is fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think. But the reason it's fun for me is because people like Imran come, and every month there'll be a new person coming. Yeah. And then we'll take advantage of wherever they're staying in whatever hotel they're in, <laughs> and we'll go to their hotel sweet yeah. overlooking the palm yeah i might have gone a bit overboard on this one i'm not doing um, it again that's what i'm saying <laughs> so this is normal for me so i do yeah. this all the time i go to yeah. all my friends hotel suites yeah. uh, I, I also think that there's some education around the issue of living in dubai i think mm. if you live in dubai there are other risks you face and there are benefits you have we know there's no knife crime mm. but also i just paid for my health insurance and i'm 40 my wife and my wife is considerably younger and my son is only three years old. And yeah, my policy is about 9,000 pounds and it's still not a global policy. Mm. So that's quite expensive and any of it goes up. So, so you're saying yeah, you can't go skiing on your policy yeah. because if you went skiing or injured, it's not yeah, covered. The, yeah, so in UK we have travel healthcare, right? Mm. For water sports or, mm. or, or winter sports. But over here, you have to find a policy that will cover you for non-emergency for emergencies. Now, if you break your leg, it's an emergency, but it becomes gray if you intended to take an activity which uh, might risk you breaking your leg. Mm. Now, any insurance policy is only as good as when you need to use it, you just don't know and <laughs> we, we don't need to use it right now. At least until you need to use insurance, there's a mm. big risk. Mm. This is why I have a considerably a big car, mm. because I don't want to have a car accident. It's a big car. Yeah. It's a big car. Yeah, <laughs> big a car. very big car. I don't think we, that car, I'd be like to say that that would not work in London. <laughs> no, not even. <laughs> Driving through a road and that thing is just yeah. completely, it's a big, what, Lincoln something, wasn't it? Yeah, Lincoln? Uh, Navigator. Yeah, Navigator. Navigator. That is a, yeah, it's a nice big car. It only works on big streets like this. Yeah. yeah, or when someone else is parking it for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's the life he lives, man. Yeah. Uh, but the reason is because I have, I have a family to protect. Mm. If this is even London, people are nicer when they drive, mm. not over here. Yeah. So there's different risks. I think Dubai, for me anyway, I think there's going to be a difference, isn't it, between the way you do Dubai and the way I do Dubai. Because I do Dubai and I've always yeah. done it like a holiday, always. Like I've always come here and I have a good time. And thanks to recent occurrences, it means that I can also keep working while I'm out here. And it's a different kind of work though, because when you live here, it's different because you don't have the fancy hotels and all that kind of thing, right? But then you've got quite a nice, what I've noticed that the complexes around there are really nice. The places that people yeah. live yeah, still yeah. have pools yeah, and gyms yeah. and all that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Halfway, 
yeah so what you're talking about is radiology while you're traveling mm. and versus so is your traveling radiologist life any closer to what my life is like over here or how yeah, close are they yeah, maybe? Yeah. How, how comparable are they so we do go to uh, the hotels mm. but instead of going to the hotel and staying three nights we just mm. go for the afternoon actually that's not true you did stay one night we didn't you manage left. to stay yeah, yeah you left <laughs> we, we stayed on the palm but uh, we left at uh, 11 p.m because the baby <laughs> wouldn't sleep uh, we slept in our own bed which i think is great yeah, yeah and then we went back in the morning <laughs> so that's you can't ever beat that yeah but at the same time when you're here and you're working, one of the problems with teleradiology at the moment is that if you don't work, you don't earn. Mm. Innovators mm. within the company are trying to come up with new ways to do this, mm. uh, whether that have it, uh, having portable stations or mm. traveling hubs. One company's got a hub in Bali now. Oh, you wow, can go there that. and travel. Okay. Oh, I think I saw that on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I, looked, I saw it on LinkedIn. There yeah, are hubs yeah. in Dubai now. Mm. There are hubs in South Africa. But, but the idea is that you can travel and report. Um, that also means you can sample a life longer than a holiday period. You can mm. live there for three months mm. or so, as long as your visa allows you to live. So mm. I think you can get, there's a new there's a new lifestyle growing in the middle and it's mm. between yours in London and mine over here. Yeah. Not that mine's a party lifestyle. I, I have to earn a lot of money to, mm. to live even a basic life over here. But mm. that new life has got, you should watch the space. I think there's going to be a lot of change within that segment. Um, yeah, I think we I think, will be the innovators. I think you you said it correctly. Is pleasure right? That's pleasure. what it is, right? Because I think I've spoken about this. I in stole the, that. Stole that. Okay, right. <laughs> that I've done a, a video where I was talking a lot about what is it you want to do with your life, and I started to think to myself, okay, what do I do on holiday, and whatever I do on holiday is what I want to do really, right? So if I've got no work to do, what do I do? So when I go on holiday, I go to nice hotels, I go get a massage, I go to the swimming pool, and all that kind of stuff. So I start trying to take take out some of those concepts out of holiday and put it as my normal life to try and make life more fun yeah, yeah life more like a holiday but yeah. thanks to this kind of thing it also means that you end up you can do the both like the yeah. literally like business and leisure pleasure where yeah you can do that normally have your nice spa memberships and all that kind of thing but also still go to a nice sunny place when it's slightly colder in the uk and still get to do your work and still and i think with my parents when i told them listen i'm going to be going away for a bit but i'm going to do some work they're like when are you actually going to stop working but my point was like, I don't want, people want to stop working because they feel like they're very stressed out. But if you don't yes. really feel particularly stressed yes. out, then there's no reason to stop working. You can just keep working. And it's still fun, right? Waking up in the morning, doing a few hours, and then going off to swim and yeah. that kind of thing is not that much of a big deal yeah. compared to waking up doing no work and then going to swim to me right now. The wider thing about teleradiology, is this like a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? Is that a fair thing to say? I can see where it comes from. Uh, it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. my, my company in particular, Everlight Radiology, what they do is they're very good at having doctors around the world work for different regions. So if I work for England, I could be anywhere in the world and the same for Australia. Mm -hmm. Several of Everlight's doctors are either in Australia, mm -hmm. also now in the UAE, but also India. There is sometimes discontent about doctors who are living abroad. And so Everlight's answer to that, I think, has matured as well because they can see where the problem is. But there is also a need for the service. So these doctors in England, they're burning the candle at both ends. Mm. They're offloading the pressure from these doctors so that they can work the night shift for England in a more favorable time zone for them, such as Australia and India. And not only does that mean that the doctor in England doesn't have to do the scan and wake up and can be fresh for the next day, but it also means because it's daylight for someone else uh, in Australia, the price that the hospital's paying for the scan is also a daylight price, Sounds which means actually in a way that it's cheaper to run that service, necessity drives innovation. And I think in the world of teleradiology, it's quite a good move. I think that's been quite a unique thing about Everlight in that they they really do make use of the, the time differences between places, right? And I think for us anyway, we know that, let's say you're in a hospital and you've got a finite number of consultants, and then if you're getting those consultants to do the night shifts, that would mean that the next day's worth of work is going to be gone, but whether that's mm. ultrasound or MDTs and that kind of thing. And it can mm. actually be, it just depends on how you use it, right? And I think mm. even on a personal base, that was something we were going to talk about in terms of, okay, so for example, what I think one of the big questions is, UAE, like what's the di what is the big difference between working? Because you've done both. You've worked mm -hmm. in the UAE system and you've also kind of done, you've worked in the NHS, the UAE system, and they're also doing teleradiology. Yeah. Like well, there's been some differences, isn't there? Like, yeah, between all of those things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to come back to one point you had about taking advantage of these, of the time zones. But 
In answer to your first question, uh, your, your current uh, point, working between the three different in, uh, essentially industries, I think the most comfortable work I ever did was within the NHS because I had a great time with my friends, valuable work, subspecialty work, my subspecialties in particular, and MSK and neuroradiology, and, and the meetings, lots of interaction. But then there was, of course, the, the on-call and the night shift. Mm. One of the hospitals had, okay. which meant it was an attractive place to work because you didn't actually have to get up at night unless the link went down. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a pull factor for them compared to their competition. Mm. Whereas the other hospital was a tertiary centre. It had a neuroradiologist, a, 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 a general or body radiologist, and then an interventional radiologist mm -hmm. on call. And yes, even then you'd expect the registrar to cover the work, mm -hmm. but there's a lot to get through yeah, the yeah. next day. So it was a bit of a, it's a week long worth of on call. So it wasn't so attractive, but it was a teaching hospital. Mm. Over here, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Private healthcare means you don't really have registrars when you're on call. Mm. You're on call through the night. Yeah. And you'll be reporting all the scans and you have to have a quick turnaround time within half an hour to an hour. Mm -hmm. And scans just happen without you knowing what's coming through the scanner. So it's oh, uneasy. Okay. And the risk is higher as well because sometimes you have to report from a laptop. Not an ideal position. Mm. Then you have teleradiology, which I think if you're living in the UAE, you're working for the UK, the risk profile, the governance profile is of the UK, mm. which we're used to, and it's more fair and equitable, mm -hmm. and there's something behind it. Mm. And then, of course, you have the time zone where you're three hours ahead. If you're doing on call, you might just be awake early. Mm. For example, if you start your day at four o'clock in the morning, well, I do, yeah. <laughs> it's one o'clock in the morning for England. Yeah, that's the thing I've got to say, there is a big difference from what I can tell when you work in a private company versus the NHS, and like you say, there is a bit of a comfort when you work in, in the NHS because you get to know people, they get to know you, and even the clinical team that you're working with, they get to know you as well. If there's like a spelling error or something that doesn't quite make sense, it's more of a, like a tap on the shoulder, hey mate, Imran, I, you, you might have made a mistake there. But when you start doing some more private work, then a lot of reputation goes on that. If you make a mistake on a report, then they can really come after you. And in teleradiology, that can also be a bit of a, mm. a challenge because if the clinicians just know who you are, they're like, mm. I, I don't know who this is. They've written this report. I don't know what they're talking mm. about. I need to find my local person to mm. try and help me out. And that's the thing. I think everything's got a challenge, but I, I guess where I come from, where you come from, is you've got to, you've got to try and make it work for you. And I think that's mm. one of the things I've really talked about on my channel anyway, and podcasting and all the rest of it is really trying to figure out where you're trying to get to and seeing if you can make work for you rather than you work for work, if that makes any sense, right? Mm, but very much. How would you say with, okay, teleradiology, right? If people don't know, it's paper scan, right? Paper yes, scan. Yes. And I think that's pretty much generally the way it is for teleradiology. It's not when you've got an employment in the NHS or anywhere, you get a sort of a, a base pay and that's just the way it is. And then you can do some extra work if you want to. But teleradiology, it really is just, you get paid per scan, right? Work-life balance. You could just work all day, couldn't you? Yes, and well, because you get paid per scan. Yeah. yeah. You make an interesting point because it is paper scan, mm. but if you look at the NHS tariffs, mm. uh, actually the way uh, you bill the government is per scan as well when you're in an oh, NHS really? hospital. Okay. So that part of it's paper scan, but what we see is um, a protected hourly income job, mm. right, paid per uh, unit of time. Mm. Uh, yes, we don't have that in teleradiology. So I think that, I, I think you've spoken about this as well, but we end up covering, doing an amount of work which allows us to be able to live our life the way we want to live it mm. for whatever motives you have, saving money or living lavishly. Mm. Uh, and I think you have to know what your limit is or what your number is. Yeah, I, I guess it's working backwards rather than forwards because I think what I've noticed in the beginning anyway for me yeah. is that I was working forwards. So I just, the point was to try and make as much as possible and it didn't really matter. But as you start to work backwards, you realize actually, this is how much I need to do, how much I need to do this, this is how much I need to do this. And once I've got that, then I don't, I'm not too bothered. It's completely fine. And I think that is, that's a really big pivotal point as to when you can start making things work for you, right? Because otherwise, yeah. Like I've joked in a previous video, yeah. you could go meet up with your friends or keep scanning or yeah. you could go spend time with your kids and stuff but, or you could just keep reporting, right? And that's where the challenge is. But the other things that like I get a lot of questions asked about teleradiology and people find my number, and which is fine by the way, if you happen to know someone that knows me, then go ahead, I, I don't really mind, I, I don't mind answering these questions. Some of the questions that people ask is like, when you're doing teleradiology, especially when you work for a company, do you have to do a minimum number of scans? Ah. The short answer is no, isn't it, Imran? Yeah. You don't have to. So I think it depends on where you're sitting. If you're sitting in the UK and they know you have an NHS contract mm. and they know you may do some private work, they're fighting for someone 
uh, who see them as second or third choice. Mm. So for example, many of my friends, they do their job and they do their teleradiology work outside of that. Mm. It brings me back to my point, so there's an issue of moonlighting here as well. Mm. But it, it, when, when you're out abroad and you might be on a contract, some of these contracts are starting to come where they're asking you for a minimum number of scans per day. Mm. But that's an employment contract mm. where you're going to get the other benefits like the NHS give you. Mm. When you're in England, so it's in answer to your question, when you're, I think when you're in England and you're not employed, you report as many scans as you can report mm. and you're comfortable reporting without working too much such that you're moonlighting or at risk and if it's your only form of income and you want to solidify your income make it stable I think there are options now out there to have a minimum number which gives you a minimum income mm. it's a development it's progress really mm. yeah I think that's the thing a lot of people will ask me well, they used to say like this that you have to do a minimum number of scans if you're going to take a station at home do you remember uh -huh, that uh -huh. yeah do you remember but I think like that's changed because I think there was some uh, it was the Uber drivers, wasn't it, or something like that? It's an yeah. IR35 yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. You, if you're not giving a contract of employment, you can't control the laws of the engagement. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is the other question is, can you work for more than one company? And for those yeah. that may have seen my name pop around, it's true. Yeah, I work for a few... <laughs> I work for some companies, okay, but you don't have to work for a particular company because as soon as a company starts to demand that you only do work for them, then you've got employment rights. And so that's when you've got to start to take into consideration. <laughs> that's when you've got to start taking into consideration that, look, yeah, there are some companies that may play a bit hardball that might say, well, you know what, you're not allowed to work for the other company. But in, in, in truth, contractually, unless you're employed, you don't have to work for one particular company. And then that, therefore, you do get a situation where someone may take advantage of the better rates that different companies may give to people, right? I think that's the right thing to do. You think I so? think that you shouldn't be employed or working with just one company because are you at risk if you have an upset if you're upset with your employer there there's a big there's a bigger partner here and that partner is the one who's giving you the scans and you're asking for the scans. If you fall out, there might be a disagreement, professional disagreement, personal disagreement, then you're also limiting yourself. And if that's your only way of income, mm. it's not a good idea. When you're not employed, I think you're within your rights to engage as many people as you want. But I guess you are pretty much employed by one company, right? Ah, yes. But then that's more because you're building something else that's different right. outside of the actual reporting. Yes, yeah, so yeah. my, in my situation, yeah. my commitment to a company is because there's uh, not only the scan reporting, it's mm. the other part of the business that's trying to develop too. So I have a clear interest uh, 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 and fondness towards this. It's really hard for them for me to work for someone else just for the just for um, more security my company uh, are offering me security and they're looking for doctors who prefer this portfolio career approach that's the thing what i found is that obviously when you work for a few companies all they really are and it's not a bad thing that's just business like they are interested in look can you do the scans or not and are you going to do their scans on time because obviously a lot of it is to do with turnaround time but there's not much more when you do teleradiology, and if you do only teleradiology, there's not much scope to develop yourself really any further. Of late, I've noticed that there are some companies um, that are interested in some of the things that you think about or say, and actually one I won't mention, but you actually get a text message every now and again from one of the people who found it saying, hey, you know, how you hope you're well. If you've got any issues, do send me a message and you can reply. And actually, they, I, I test them out just to see, is this just like a bot or something? And I, I sent a voice <laughs> message saying, hey, mate, yeah, really great. I do enjoy working for your company. And they sent me a voice message back. I was like, oh, okay. Oh. This person's for real, like they're actually, and they did look into some of the things I was talking about. So it just depends on the company. Some companies are not interested in anything beyond just you doing the reporting. Some companies do want to get you inputs because they want to know whether they're doing well or the things that they can improve. And some companies do actually want to work with you to try and better themselves yeah. and actually promote you to do more things. And actually, that's what I'm starting to see from my point of view. Go on. on that point, mm. it's a little rose tinted uh, because. So when I'm a teleradiology company and I know I've got someone who reports scans for me, but mm. they're not my employee, it's in my interest to also keep them sweet mm. because they'll be working hard and I know they work hard, but I'm also not paying for their sick pay, holiday pay, mm. pension. So they're actually, in some respect, they're a cheaper deal for me to service. So mm. I need to be nice to them so that they can they can do the work I need to do. Because if mm. I'm going to have the same guy reporting as a contractor and the same guy reporting as an employee, 
actually employees more expensive. Yeah. So I think this point needs to be made. Yeah, um, that's true. Th there is a reason for someone to be nice to a teleradiologist. Yeah, it's, yeah. In, it's in your favor, it's in our favor. I think I've joked about this actually. When I first, so the reason why I started in teleradiology, I think you said yours, like for me, I didn't have a consultant job straight away. Like I think a lot of people are, are far more uh, like organized than me and they have a consultant job waiting for them, but I didn't. And so obviously I, you start to worry like, oh, you know what, what am I actually going to do with my life? Yeah. So I, start, I signed up to as many as I could and the ones that would take me at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I remember <laughs> the first time I went into one of the offices and they said, oh, Dr. Lasker, would you like a cup of coffee? And I was like, yeah, sure. Where is it? I'll go and make the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll make you the coffee. And I thought, you what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a thing. They were so nice to me. And then they're like, oh, these are fridges, all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow, I was getting treated so differently. And it's exactly what you said. Yeah. I guess for them, it's business. They've got to be yeah, nice yeah, to you. Yeah, and yeah. that's something that does come across, actually. And I get my Christmas hampers and Christmas chocolates sure, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. To keep me pleased, and I enjoy those chocolates every single year. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. This is, I think it also happens in the NHS, mm. but there's an expectation on you in the NHS when you're an employee. When you're not an employee, the expectation is not there, it's more of a hope. Mm. And I think these Christmas hampers, these free food, drink, chocolates, mm. events, dinners, they're all part of that uh, engagement process mm. to get you there. Mm. I think what the picture we're painting is a more favorable world for the radiologist within teleradiology. And it's, it's more than just the transactional value of the money. Mm. That you, You'll be treated in a certain way, mm. I think, mm. because it's in the company's best interest to treat you that way also. Mm. And I think in, in even in the NHS, some Sometimes, because we're all so tired, we take it for we take each other for granted. Yeah, that's true. But you know what? Actually, there's one hospital I was working at, and I was doing the on call, and suddenly someone came up to me and said, "Here's an envelope." And I was like, "Oh God, what is this? Like a brown envelope?" Yeah, and it was money. Did this happen to you? No. No, they actually gave me money, and it was from <laughs> the trust for Christmas because I was doing the Christmas shift, and they actually gave me money to order food. Oh, to order food? Yeah, yeah. It was literally oh, like, ten, like a ten pounds, and I was like, "Wow, okay, that's the first time in my entire life." And I'd been, I'd been kicked around a lot. Yeah, but yeah, I was yeah. actually, I thought, this is amazing. Like ten quid yeah, to get the myself, gesture. Uh, it was, it, but those little to things get you do something from the vending machine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> those little things do make a difference. They do make you feel like, oh, okay, cool. Like maybe I will do this. Genuinely, sometimes it does make a difference that oh, one company's giving me a laptop to work, and if they ask me, oh, Imran, do you mind just signing in to help with one scan like, during the on call? They're struggling. You feel like, oh, you know what? You know what? You have given me that laptop. I'll, I'll go on then. I'll log in. I'll just quickly do it. So there is. It does work. I, I yeah, do think it does. Buy yeah. yeah, it does. Okay, so now look, I think we talked about some of the challenges in teleradiology, right? So we said no minimum number of scans, but what if, so one of the questions is, what if you get a scan that you can't do? This, mm. is, this one's a little bit out of your remit and you think, you know what? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I've done one. So I often do this. If it's something I can't do, many times I'll get an MRI scan of the pelvis. It ends up being a post-cancer rectum pelvis scan. I just send it back. Mm. You just send it back. Because it's not your subspecialty, your companies, they often have a, an array of doctors. My company has, it boasts a number of 500 plus doctors, 300 plus in the UK, and that means that they have a huge skill set. When you send it back, the right guy for the right guy will report that scan. Mm. Um, it's as simple as that. That's the thing I think we miss in the NHS. Some because sometimes the buck does stop with you in the NHS. Like when you are yeah. working, the scan comes to you. The buck does stop with you. You may have someone that's slightly more yeah. senior than you that you can ask for help. But apart from that, there's not anyone else. But when you you said a number of people they have, but there's some of the people that are in Everlight and the other companies as well, they're really qualified. And so they, mm. like you said, the right man or right woman for the job is sometimes better to go to. Even if it's an MSK scan, that should really be in your remit. As soon as you feel slightly uncomfortable, oh, so true. you're actually doing everyone a favor by just passing on to the person that should do the work. And it's better that you do the things that you're comfortable with. Because the next thing is mistakes. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. That's one of the things people worry about. So mistakes, so mistakes, I think they happen in any form of radiology mm. and they're no less common in teleradiology than they are in the NHS. I think that the way they are handled is different mm. within both. And this is because of the external factors. If I'm working with you in the hospital and I find you make a mistake, I can come up to you and I can say, hey, Imran, you've missed this lesion here. Can you, do you agree with me? Am I overcalling it? Do you think we can add an addendum? Do you want to do it? Shall I do it? 
it's quite an easy conversation to have and it happens. I've had it both ways. Mm. In the NHM, in the teleradiology world, especially when you have a large number of colleagues, we don't know who the other person is. And so what we end up doing is we double report or review a percentage of each other's work mm. blindly. Mm. And then we see if there's an error or not, or we agree or disagree. And then when there is an error, it is, it is handled um, through a governance pathway, which is not a no-blame culture, it's anonymized, and the idea is for everyone to learn. Mm. It ends up being that many more mistakes come out through teleradiology because of this, yes. because it's anonymous. Mm. But it also shows a very strong uh, governance profile for the teleradiology industry in general, mm. I think. I think it's good for the appraisal. I think that's a challenge, especially as a, if you're a young radiologist going into teleradiology, it can be difficult to have someone pick at your scan. You know what I mean? Especially, uh -huh. yeah, I felt so, that. You felt that? Yeah, I felt that because I went straight into, because, yeah. yeah, of the circumstances. But I think it can be really difficult because you're always going into it feeling like you're already unqualified. You're not qualified enough and you somehow pulled the wool over people's eyes. Yeah, you just yeah. about made it through. And like someone's going to catch you out. That's what I always felt. Imposter felt. syndrome. Exactly, yeah. imposter syndrome. And you always feel like an imposter. And every time a discrepancy comes forward, you think to yourself, oh, great, here we go. I've been caught, this is going to go really badly. But I've been doing this for a while. And yes, I've made my mistakes and actually, the way I've seen it is to try and take it as learning points. And in fact, through teleradiology or in Everline in particular, there was one point where someone had called a discrepancy and I, I felt as though the tone of it wasn't right. I thought that the mm -hmm. person was being a little bit rude. Mm -hmm. So I emailed back and I said, listen, I thought that was a little bit rude. And to mm -hmm. their credit, I got a phone call from one of the uh, CDs and he said, look, I read the thing. I think maybe it didn't. It wasn't as rude as you think, but tell me why you thought it was rude. And I explained and he, goes, no. and he explained that actually I've probably taken it the wrong way. But he actually said to me, listen, they were way more senior than I was, I am, and they've been doing teleradio far longer than me. And they said to me that, look, in the beginning, when you get discrepancy, it will take you a week to get over. And you go through the same process. You think like you're terrible. You think you're rubbish. Maybe you shouldn't be a doctor in the first place. And then you take on the learning point. Then you write a reflection. Then you send it back. But as time goes on, that whole process goes from one week to five minutes. But the, the learning point, everything is still the same. It's just yeah. that you'll get better at taking those points on. Okay. Don't you think? Like that it has helped become well, a better What you're describing is the thing, attenuation. Uh, and it happens in all walks of life. It happens when you get hit, I don't know, in, in the wrong place with a football. Yeah. It, gets, it happens when you have an argument in your in a personal relationship and the first time it takes a long time to get over. Mm. But over the years, you don't really care anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, getting older, you just care about less and less. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think the point you make here is the people who are in the industry with you who are looking at the discrepancies, they've also lived a life mm. where they know that we're all in it together to help each other and to help that patient. So if I'm calling you up on this, it's because I'm also doing my job and let's do our job together make sure the patient does well. Mm. I think actually that that works really well in teleradiology because mm. we don't know each other mm. versus uh, within a small, nice, comfortable environment where we do know each other mm. and we are more likely to go through this and say, hey, there's a mistake there, can you mm. fix it? Mm. I, think, I think there's something interesting. When I was finishing training, someone said to me that you learn the most when you become a consultant, right? Mm. But I actually feel as though doing teleradiology meant that I learned even more, as in the, the cur learning curve became like this, because mm -hmm. there was two things here. You were seeing way more scans than you normally would see, depending on how much work you did. Scans from all over the country, like literally anywhere, not just in this particular area, get a certain kind of disease pattern and stuff. And then you're getting people that you've never met before, they don't know who you are, they don't really care, and they're going through your work with an honest, usually open on an honest opinion and going through it and then there's a mm. little phrase and you, you do the auditing as well for other people mm. and you start to pick up the phrase that they use oh that's a really good way to describe yeah, that good, oh, yeah, you know, oh, what yeah, do they think yeah. of that and you describe that it's like, okay i'm going to use that phrase and you bank that so you end up becoming like the sort of morphed thing of like yeah. a combination of everyone's feedback you're taking everyone best bits of what everyone else does yeah yeah and you're seeing so many scans yeah i don't think that's entirely possible doing that when you've got like a normal job I'd say because you've got MDTs, you've got phone calls, you've got management, mm. you've got auditing to do yourself. You don't have time to just concentrate on what mm. we've been trained to do, which is looking yeah. scans to the, the highest of our yeah, ability yeah, yeah. and be as accurate as possible. Have you, have you found that? Very much. But mm. I think the other thing you're mentioning here is not just looking at the scans, it's actually looking at the reports. Mm. I think that in teleradiology, I don't know why this is the case for me, but you do look through the report mm. and you look through, you may not recognize who writes the report. You might just look at the GMC number and see how old <laughs> the GMC number is. But there's a lot of information we choose to take off the page now, yeah. which is more than the report 
and it's not taught to us in the training programs it's mm. just because we've learned a way to glean as much information as you can to what you're doing yeah. so you're also noticing I think your learning curve being steep because you're finding many more sources of information exactly. tell you where you're Exactly. So now instead of having three or four consulting teachers, you've pretty much got so many people that are just going yeah. through your stuff. But then, like I said, there, there's a challenge, isn't there? And I think most of it is how you take it. Like how, how can you take it on? Don't take it personal. Take it as a learning point and just... And my actually advice to myself, actually, is if I do get a discrepancy, I don't let it linger. If you leave it for days and days, it starts to really grate you and you go, oh, God, that discrepancy mm. go back. I've got to do that. If you just look at it, deal with it straight away, email back straight away, just get it done and take your learning points and move on, then I think that is genuinely the best way to do things, right? I guess this next question is probably more for me than yourself, right? You probably did this too. Can you do Mm -hmm. NHS as well at the same time? Yeah, I did do this mm. for five years, uh, six years. I did this. I was working as a registrar, mm. as a, a tele in teleradiology. You can definitely do NHS. In fact, I think teleradiology companies still see the NHS as the number one go-to position for the doctor, mm. and then they're fighting for the number two spot, mm. whether it's between each other or mm. with, against private medicine. Mm. Yeah, I don't think there's much to say. About yeah, I think yeah, I think a few companies in particular they do want you to be a, a consultant for at least two years. And some of them actually want you to still be a consultant in the NHS because there are some things like, for example, MDTs and that kind of thing that do have some value in your learning experience, right? As you get more and more senior, start getting more questions come to you. Yeah. Right? Um, And I think that is one of the things that people often ask. But then that doesn't mean that you can't go into teleradiology full time because it's just a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Don't you think? Yeah, I think if you look at this from a position of marketing, the people who either want you to have two years experience Mm. or they want you to have uh, ongoing NHS experience, there are two things happening here. One is that they're giving the NHS the highest value, Mm. which in the same breath, they're reducing their own value, I Mm. think, which I don't necessarily agree with. And then they're also differentiating themselves from each other there are many teleradiology players they have to find a way to differentiate themselves from each other mm. some people say two years some people say no we even take registrars because we train them mm. in teleradiology and mm. then they're talking about your learning curve that mm. those registrars will have two years worth worth of uh, teleradiology learning mm. more than the guy who starts two years later mm. so i think there's many ways to skin that yeah i think there are things that for me anyway i felt as though when you are doing like your, you're getting paid your standard rate, there are efficiencies that you don't pick up because you're not forced to pick up efficiencies because you just, you, okay, you know yeah, you're working. Yeah, yeah. And what I found as well is that like, they'll say that you go to work and you work eight hours a day. But then yeah. actually when you take a step back, you're not really working eight hours a day. You're like going in, having coffee, chatting to your friends, answering That's email, right. taking yeah. a few phone calls. But if you just did reports and reports only, you start to notice a little efficiencies in terms of, oh, hang on, why am I got that key instead of that key because that's yeah. close to my hand? Or maybe I should make the screen slightly close to that way so yeah. I can actually have a look at it with both eyes rather than moving my head. All these little things you start to really think about. Yeah. And I think that's where I think that teleradiology has got its advantages for me anyway, that it, everything I've learned from teleradiology, I've brought back into my normal workflow within the NHS in terms of trying to make sure that I've got the best view, got the best screen, got the best mice, mouse or whatever, the best keyboard that I can get. Because actually there is a value and thought process that is not afforded to within the NHS itself. And no one's going to come up to you and say, if you want to be efficient with your time here, there's a way yeah. you should do this. Oh, you've yeah. got a consultant job, you're doing urgents, you're doing this for yeah. now, and you just got to yeah. do it the best way you can, right? Yes, I think that if you were... But I also think if you were going to do eight hours worth of work in three hours and someone said, hey, you don't need those other five, let's not pay you for them, yeah, then yeah. you may have an issue with, with that as well. So yeah, yeah. I think the two systems, they don't really meet. Mm. One is pay per hour mm. and one is pay per unit. Mm. While you're bringing your efficiencies in from one to the other, as you should, mm. you're finding more time to do the rest of your work for the NHS, mm. which I think is fair because the amount of extra report, non-reporting work you have to do in the NHS is often more than they give you time for. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I think I took one manual roll once, and all it was was really minor. I had to just do the registrar's rotor for every single week, and they gave me like some bit of a session for it, and that ended up taking like three sessions just because I tried. Oh, I'm going to put it on this Wednesday morning. I'm going to do it, but then I did it on the Wednesday morning. Email it back, and a whole lot of issues. Yeah. More issues come during the week, and it just went on and on. And then by the time I'd done it, yeah. I pretty much spent three or four sessions on this one thing that wasn't yeah. really meant to. But then I also think that had I been more efficient with the reports and all the rest of it, then I could have at the time. 
I could have done my report and then concentrated on that and then given myself back some time in other ways. Good point. Yeah. But I was very junior when I took that role on. And actually, this is, I don't know whether, you, you don't have to agree to this at all, but sometimes what I think is when you start a new job and someone starts giving you management roles, you gotta ask yourself, why? Why would you, out of the blue, walk into a department and they start giving you these fantastical roles? Usually because they don't want it. Anyway, that's my personal opinion. Just so Any parting things you want to talk about? No, I think that you should explore the space. There are plenty of competitors out there for teleradiology. I think you should get in contact with these people. You're welcome to contact me or any of the people that you know in teleradiology. And I think it's a space where you're going to learn. It's a new segment involving particularly traveling radiology. Mm. And uh, good luck to you. Yeah, I think from my point of view, I say the same thing as you, and I've said this on every single video that I've done so far, is just take a look, have a conversation, just see what it's like, and hopefully as time goes on, you can subscribe and all that jazz, see what I'm getting up to, and as you know, I'm very honest about the things I do, and always welcome to answering any questions, and I know you are too. Yeah, just watch your space, and yeah, try and see if you can get involved, because it is exciting, isn't it? This yeah. whole space really right now. It's yeah. got to be one of the most exciting things, especially with the new innovations and things people are getting up to and the new ideas that are coming out with. I think it's really, it's just cool, man. It really is. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much, Great man. Day. To the next video, yeah? All right. Thank you. Bye.